Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Mike Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Loftus, and Mark Raycroft. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed. We're here with Mark Raycroft coming to us from lovely Canada, Michael Morrow from Colorado, and Bernd Ossus coming to us from Norway. It has taken a couple weeks to try to figure out the timing because we have an eight-hour time difference between Michael and I and Bernd, and Mark is in the middle. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for giving us your time and coming on Wild and Exposed podcast, Bernd. Thank you. So just to get started, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a Norwegian. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, worked as a transaction lawyer for several years. Um, then uh, went to the other side in 2008 and uh, have been working as a private equity uh, fund manager since then. And uh, I have, since I was a kid, uh, been uh, very much into wildlife photography. That has been my past, uh, my, my off time, uh, yeah, uh, my, my free time. So you've been doing this for several years then? I got my first camera when I was uh, 13 years old uh, and started roaming around my um, parents' farm uh, shooting lo local wildlife. So give us an example of what that local wildlife would be for you around a farm. Um, if you Im imagine uh, Alaska and then um, divide by three, then you have Norway, Norwegian wildlife. So we have pretty much, it's very similar. Uh, we have uh, the moose, we have the caribou, uh, we have uh, the squirrels. This Actually, they're pretty much the same species, uh, very much looking the like, the same, but uh, the Norwegian species are slightly smaller. What about predators? What type of predators do you have? Um, in terms of the big four, we have the lynx, uh, we have the wolves, uh, we have uh, brown bears, and we have the wolverine. Uh, then obviously foxes. Uh, this morning I was shooting uh, Arctic foxes uh, not far from uh, my girlfriend's uh, cabin. Uh, and uh, we have the red foxes. Uh, and of course, a wide range of, of winged uh, predators. We'll get into it a little bit more soon, but your Arctic fox images are stunning. You've got them in several different types of light and qualities of light and uh, th those images really draw people into your page and we'll we'll put that in the show notes as well so others can go and and view your page because there's some incredible imagery on there thank you very much that's very kind of you well in the use of light and color i find your feed is one of the best for pop for saturated color balance on instagram i've really enjoyed seeing your pictures over the last few years that way and just your use of varying light and, and your eye for good light. So, yes, absolutely, people. Go and, and hit that link on the show notes and, and check out the Instagram feed of Burnt's because it's phenomenal. I love your saturation, the way you work your post edit and processing. Thank you. Composition, too. Don't get me wrong. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> we always start out every podcast with a new guest talking about a highlight experience that you've had over the course of the years. And I know it's hard when you've been shooting for a long time, it's hard to identify that one thing or that, that one experience that was just awesome. Do you have a highlight experience that you could just describe, you know, some sort of photographic or even just, it doesn't even have to be, you had a picture. It was just an experience out in the woods where you were just awe inspired. Now, I have so many uh, great moments I've experienced out there, so it's very hard to pick one, but, uh, but different kinds of experiences. Um, uh, maybe the one I remember the most, if I were to pick only one moment, uh, it actually took place in, in Alaska, in Denali National Park. Uh, and uh, I was shooting um, a grizzly with two cubs, uh, two, uh, probably two year old cubs. Um, and uh, they were in a very safe distance on the river delta, some 200 meters out. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, the mother just got up on her legs uh, on two and, and, and started sniffing around. And they st all of a sudden, they started running straight at me. 
uh, I don't think they even knew I was there. So they probably had something behind them. And uh, I was shooting uh, <laughs> because you get so focused during so such moments like that. And uh, they basically stopped um, just 20 meters in front of me, and I, I had my I had my one hand on the bear spray <laughs> by, by that by that time. So that was an amazing experience. Got some great footage, and um, something you I spent a couple of hours to shake off afterwards. So do you think it was something behind them that just spooked her enough to just send her in your direction? She obviously wasn't coming for you. She was just trying to get away from something behind her? Uh, definitely. She was mo uh, and that's probably why I was uh, not that uh, <laughs> scared about it because I know that they were not running for me. Uh, but still, you have three bears uh, coming in your direction and and 20 meters off uh, that is that is close. Yes. That's always a question you get when you shoot bears. Yeah. Yeah. When they're closing fast like that. Yeah. And then you don't want to surprise them either. No, no. I was just standing there and, and, uh, and not doing anything other than uh, actually shooting and uh, starting waving my hand and trying to make them aware of me. And once they got aware of me, they basically stopped, turned around and, and went the other way. Those are the types of experiences that we all, once they're over, they're the ones that they kind of stay in our memories. But while it's happening, there's there's some unknowns. And like you, like you said, you've got one hand on the bear spray and you're trying to shoot with the other hand and, and still capture that moment. But those are the fun ones. And uh, if I am to pick one other moment, uh, just very briefly, um, uh, that was the opposite kind of experience. I was uh, shooting uh, red-throated loons. Uh, just before sunrise, and the sun rose that morning uh, and created the, uh, just a crazy atmosphere with the fog lifting and uh, the sun getting through. Um, it's uh, probably the most beautiful moment I've experienced, and that is also something you carry with you afterwards. Oh, for sure. And, and the silence that probably that moment had, right? absolute silence uh, this spot is uh, uh, seven eight kilometers from the closest road and and uh, just absolute silence mark talked about your the the color and your use of light you said you started when you were young how did you kind of develop that style over time did you have any mentors that you worked with or was that just kind of trial and error on your part uh, in the first years, I did not have any um, mentors. Just uh, and I also, I took short, crappy uh, photographs. Uh, but uh, once I got into the age of eighteen, nineteen, twenty, uh, I started following or looking at the work of uh, some of the Norwegian uh, wildlife photographers and also nature photographers, uh, the likes of uh, Dag Rettereng, uh, Paul Hermansen. Um, they uh, they had a way of uh, working that uh, drew me closer into into um, into uh, that world, and uh, then I started experimenting with. Uh, when I grew up, uh, it was uh, uh, you had to put the camera. Uh, um, at eight, <laughs> f-stop f, f eight, and and uh, you have to have the sun in the back and all that stuff. And and at one point, I have stopped having the sun in the back, and and um, I mostly prefer to shoot uh, with some back uh, with the objects being back like lit directly or indirectly. And I think uh, uh, and it's, it's sort of a pity because uh, my style got somewhat one-dimensional that way, uh, but I love those um, the, that atmosphere that creates so much that I basically uh, avoid shooting um, uh, when when the weather light conditions are not uh, that way, unless it's really bad weather. I love bad weather, heavy rain, heavy snow, uh, but uh, if it, if not, it should be very low angle light. Once the sun gets about 10 degrees on the sky, um, it, it's not usable anymore. You can see that in your work. And something to elaborate for our listeners' benefit is that Bernd was the Nature Photographer of the Year in Norway. Not once, but 2014, 2016, 2017, 2019. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I saw that on your feed, as, as Mark just alluded to. And that leads me to ask, you know, did you just take 2015 and 
2018 off? I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it's a very special uh, competition. You have to submit uh, um, a portfolio of work of some 50 images, and they are juried over 10 rounds, five each. So, uh, and it takes a lot to be able to present 50 uh, competition quality images. So, we have to take one year off and shoot. <laughs> So they jury the entire 50 images, your, the entire portfolio. Yeah, each image is giving a, 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 an, a, an amount of points, so to speak, uh, and they're all added up. And I assume they all have to be taken during that year, those that 12-month period? Uh, no, they're not. They are necessarily? Not. No. Uh, so just you, representation you, of your portfolio. It could be from two years ago, but just selecting 50. Yeah. Very the good. limitation is that you can't uh, present uh, several versions of the same motive. It has to be, and, and they also compare season to season. So um, if I've delivered uh, some work in 2014 uh, and, and something similar now, uh, what I deliver now is being disqualified. So, so um, you have to be, that is the biggest uh, issue. You have to be careful not to pick something you've used before. So in, in practice, uh, practice you, you, you basically use the couple of last year's work. Right. Which means you have to be very prolific. I would like to, but uh, regretfully, my, I'm limited to some 35 to 40 uh, nights out uh, uh, a year. So, so it's most, most of my shots are shot early Saturday morning and early Sunday morning. I can relate to that. <laughs> These two guys just go out whenever they want. But. Yeah. <laughs> there's still, there's still but, some but, uh, strings attached sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think there is a benefit to to being restricted on time. Um, you make the time count. Uh, I think that I would be a little bit more sloppy if if I had could go out and shoot every day. Uh, now you have to really plan and make sure that you make the time count. Another backside of that is obviously that you have to concentrate on relatively few species, very relatively few places, in order to be able to produce the right quality. So, do you have a plan then every every like weekend? Do you are you like okay this weekend I'm going to go for lynx, or this weekend I'm going to go for fox, or are you opportunistic in with just an area that that will provide several different opportunities? It depends on. Uh, mostly, I'm very focused on uh, shooting one specific species, uh, and but it all comes down to if the, the weather needs to be right, the wind needs, needs to come in the right direction and so on. So if that doesn't fit, I find something else to do that weekend. But I also have some opportunistic trips, may, may, mainly scouting trips, uh, where you occasionally get a good shot, uh, but uh, most of the good shots are planned. And then in Norway, what is the I guess summer would be your best opportunity for lots of lots of different things, right? But do you have a favorite season or, or a favorite time of year to go out? No, I, I, I have to answer no to that question. Um, every season has its charm. And right now, it's just fantastic what happens with the snow coming. The, uh, the Arctic foxes are now completely white. Uh, this morning, I shot a completely white uh, female. That was uh, fairly cooperative, and and um, uh, it's just amazing. Um, you, you have the I love the season where you have the first snow, where you have dark background with the heavy snow uh, falling with the muskox, with the moose, and so on. Um, but obviously, you are right. Uh, the spring uh, is a very very busy time in Norway in terms of wildlife. You have all the uh, my uh, migratory birds that are coming up from the south to going to Norway or even further north, um, and it's teeming with life everywhere. So it's it's uh, you don't have to travel uh, more than five minutes in any directions to find something to to shoot in Norway during spring. That sounds idealistic. Wow. Say that again. <laughs> you don't have to travel what more than. <laughs> More than five minutes in any direction to find something um, that makes sense to to shoot from a wildlife perspective. That sounds amazing to me. It, it sounds a lot like Alaska. I mean, like you alluded to earlier, it's there's wildlife everywhere and opportunities everywhere. 
No, no, it's very much like Alaska. You would be surprised if you if you know Alaska intimately and come to Norway, you would you could uh, confuse the two. Uh, but you have uh, obviously uh, Mount Denali um, or Mount McKinley. What is the name now? Denali. Um, Denali. Denali. Um, 6,000 plus meters, the tallest, um, and the highest mountain in Norway is from 2006. A couple of species that I wanted to ask about. One you already you already mentioned. I see a lot of Norwegian photographers that have images of wolverines. And while there are wolverines in, in the States and in Alaska and, and certainly in Canada, those opportunities are fairly rare. It seems to be, I mean, it's not obviously common. But it seems to be a species that is certainly photographable in uh, certain areas. Yes, uh, they are. But uh, most of the images you see, they are from uh, uh, from baited um, uh, uh, professional places in Finland, on the bordering to Russia, uh, where they are uh, basically feeding the wolverines, and everybody can come and pay a few bucks and and shoot. So uh, I have to admit that that is, that is not uh, my thing. Uh, but of course, it's uh, great for people to be able to experience these animals. Uh, just to put it another way, I spend a lot of time in the mountains. I've only uh, come across uh, wild wolverines uh, two, three times. I've only been able to okay. shoot reasonably one time. You said they are hunted. They are hunted, and, and in order to keep the population down, uh, the government is actually taking out the cubs uh, and uh, in, in a large number. So it's a rather distasteful practice, but it's, it's being done. And do they do that for, for predation reasons, like it's on livestock, or what, what is the reason for that? Uh, the main reason is to protect livestock uh, sheep. Huh. I always found it odd. I mean, I think... Wolverines get a bad rap. I'm not sure that they're as vicious and as people think they are, but maybe I just don't know enough about the varied populations. Yeah, they they are not. Uh, I, I don't uh, see them as vicious as vicious at all. Um, and uh, I think it's um, they're all. We also have um, uh, farmed reindeer in in Norway or. Uh, the uh, the uh, Aboriginal people in Norway, the, the Laps, they are uh, having uh, reindeer as uh, domesticated reindeers, and it's also partly to protect uh, their herds because they are can be quite tough on the reindeer in the calving se- season. I guess I could see that with the with the calving, you know, the wolverines could do that. I would just find it hard that a wolverine could bring down an adult. Oh, oh yes, they do. Uh, I actually a friend of mine got footage of a wolverine bringing down a, a adult uh, female reindeer. Uh, it was amazing. It just uh, the the way it hunted was just uh, fantastic to look look at, and uh, something I would give my pinky finger to be able to experience myself. <laughs> yeah, your pinky finger is probably the least useful in photography, so that would be a. I wouldn't sacrifice. Care. <laughs> <laughs> I've said a couple of times time. I might I might sell a kidney because I only need one, right? Might sell a kidney to go and experience some of these things in nature just to just to have that experience, but I haven't done it yet. I haven't found anybody that wanted to take it. The other species that I was curious about because we in Wyoming, uh, one of the big things that we do in the spring is uh, photograph grouse sage grouse and sharp tail grouse and your images of the the capricali is that how you pronounce it uh, yeah uh, in norwegian it's tiur uh, but uh, we, the way we pronounce it in english is capricali but Kepikeli. i don't know if uh, you probably know better i i don't <laughs> i've just read it and seen the images and some of the the images of these birds are stunning now is that obviously are are they a, a lecking bird so they come to the same spot Yes, they do. Um, have, we have four lecking species in Norway, and the Capicale is one of them. And I've been on the Capicale lake uh, for the last 20 years. Yeah, um, some of the images that you've got with uh, the morning breath. I mean, obviously, you've spent some time there, too, because one doesn't go out and go for that shot the first time they're there. 
No, I've had the seasons where I've uh, worked specifically with uh, those kind of images, backlit images. First of all, it's not often a uh, clear sky that time of year. Right. And uh, when, when it is, uh, you basically have to um, do only those shots because you basically can't do the other shots you would like to do. So I have had a couple of seasons where I didn't get anything, basically just waiting for those situations to, to happen. And uh, the first time I really I was really successful doing that was in 2014, uh, when uh, I had to, uh, there were only one place on the lake where they could be exposed against the rising sun. Uh, and uh, uh, but n nothing happened there <laughs> until one day um, this young uh, Kepi Kelly came up there and 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 uh, posed and that uh, picture was uh, the runner up in uh, the European Wildlife Photographer of the Year in 2015 and 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 also quite interestingly from the same lake but a very different photo was the runner up in this year's competition in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year in Europe. That's a that's a bit fun. I don't think that is something that happens often. That's a nice oh, place. Congratulations. Yeah, that those images are stunning, and they're they seem to be a fairly large lecking bird. I mean, they're they look to be larger than our sage grouse, which are fairly good sized. Oh yes, right. uh, I think your your grouse is around four pounds, something like that, and these are ten pounds. Wow. Oh, so they're almost as big as a turkey. <laughs> yes, they're big. They're very they large. Have, like a spruce grouse, they, they have the, the males have the red eyebrows, right? The red flash? Yes, they do. Yeah. Very photogenic. And who gets breath from a bird, right? <laughs> How cool is that for an image? You don't see that very often. But they're very photogenic bird. And and a lot like our spruce grouse, but on, Nor on Norwegian Northland steroids, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, they're very stunning to look at. The other thing that you see a lot on your Instagram feed is the ermine. Is that a short tail weasel? Uh, and I have to say that I've only photographed uh, the ermines twice in my life. <laughs> really? So, so you have, I, I pretty much uh, lay, laid out mo all of them there. <laughs> but I, have, I had two amazing experiences. The first one back in 2012. If you have seen the shots with the with the ermine and the lemming, um, that was 2012, and we had a an amazing um, lemming year that year. They were everywhere, and I was out shooting uh, grouse, willow grouse, and was sitting there with my binoculars um, and saw what I thought was a neck of a white uh, grouse, some uh, about a kilometer away, a kilometer away, and I started trotting in that direction. And when I got there, I saw in my binoculars uh, uh, this uh, ermine hunting. And uh, uh, he got interested in me, uh, started, uh, they are amazingly fast. So, so I started sh shuttling around and, and uh, I got some shots. And all of a sudden, this poor lemming came out of its hole. I saw it uh, in the same moment as the ermine saw it. And uh, I moved my camera over and... Um, it just happened. I couldn't. I was shooting at uh, I think six uh, six images a second, and and some of the, those images were, were just great. A once in a lifetime experience. Oh, for sure, that was a great find, and to see the neck of an ermine from a kilometer away, <laughs> that was a great spot. As well. But it was it was uh, it was uh, the snow had come and gone. So it was dark, so it was standing out quite uh, quite well. Oh, I looked at your feet also and kind of thought that maybe they were a little bit more common than they are here. Uh, the, I, I see them maybe um, every third year or so, and uh, I've only had two chances of really shooting uh, decent images of them. Now, how far, I mean, do you have to drive 10 minutes to get to muskox or are they a little <laughs> bit further away? No, the muskox in Norway is they are are limited to the national mountain we have uh, Dovrefjell, um, and I'm actually just uh, 20 minutes away from there now. Uh, so it, it's one and a half hours drive from where I live, 
okay. so so uh, but they are easy to find and uh, you have to walk at most four or five kilometers to get get to them well that's very doable what an experience and then to get the weather and the change of seasons uh, envious of that I've never worked much with uh, muskox. Uh, the, fir- f- the first time I started doing it seriously was uh, this autumn. So I'm going to uh, work uh, through the winter with muskox. Um, so I'm really looking forward to those uh, winter mornings with uh, with uh, gale force winds and, and snow. So it's really, really great. Yeah, that's the shot that I would like to get. But again... The only opportunity that we have in the States is in Alaska. And I believe Mark's got some places in Canada that you could go to, but Are very more than, remote. More than uh, an hour and 20 minutes to get to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and more than a four or five kilometer hike, but it's doable. <laughs> It's on the radar. There are there are islands and places that planes do access in the north, but it wouldn't be cheap, but would be an amazing story to tell. I, I think that is part of the beauty of Norway. Um, Nature photography is, uh, is accessible for anybody, um, and uh, we have wildlife everywhere. Uh, you never have to go far. Well, that was one of my questions for you was, I think if you live in the U.S., you just automatically say, oh, I'm just going to go to Alaska and shoot, right? Or you're going to go to Yellowstone, or you're going to go to the Tetons, or you're going to go to all the different places we have. But looking at your feed and looking at what's available in Norway – it looks like a pretty awesome place. Is it doable just to say, okay, I'm going to go to Norway. What would somebody do? Where would they fly into? And how would you coordinate that kind of a trip? Would it, is it just like going to Alaska where you just go to, you know, one of the major cities, rent a car and then plan your trip from there? Or is it more difficult than that? I, I think it's a good idea to talk to someone that knows the local wildlife, because if you start from scratch, you wouldn't know where to look. Uh, but there are quite a few guys, uh, very, very clever uh, photographers that are uh, doing guide services. Um, and uh, my recommendation would be to talk to some of them. So, uh, and, uh, and then if someone uh, visits uh, my home place or one of my cabins, I'm happy to, happy to point you in the right direction. Yeah, that's, and that's something that we talk about often is networking. Um, with photographers from any location that you're going to, but also if you're going to a new location or you're going somewhere like that, hire a guide at least at least for a day or two yeah. to kind of learn the the lay of the land. But but also there are quite a few places in Norway, some hotspots where you can basically just get the coordinates. Um, I had one example. I had a, a friend of mine from the southern part of Norway. Um, he had never photographed uh, the lacking great snipes, so he uh, he he had a he had a wish. Uh, he is a Liverpool supporter, a soccer supporter, and uh, he, it was almost as important for him to get uh, some photos of the great snipe as it was for Liverpool to win. So <laughs> so so, but I unfortunately I was supposed to guide him to this place, and it it was um, it was uh, difficult to access this summer because the snow uh, was still meter thick in the first of June when they are lacking. And um, it is a four kilometer walk uh, into the, this particular lake, so it's hard to find. Uh, but I was unable, uh, because of other uh, engagements, to join him. So I just gave him the coordinates, and he was able to find it. And it, that's a, that's actually great. Uh, he was. Uh, it's a, just a small area, some twenty times twenty meters, and these birds they are very silent. So you have to get it spot on. And he got some great images, even. The mating, uh, which I have was quite envious about, because I've tried for 15 years without getting it. <laughs> yeah, I I guided uh, a friend of ours on a grouse trip, and I had never photographed mating grouse. Uh, you know, I'd seen them fighting and that type of thing. The first morning he was on the lek, he got images and video of mating grouse, and so I think he thinks that. That's going to happen every time now. <laughs> <laughs> Some people just bring the good luck. I, I, agree. I invite those people again and again, <laughs> as long as that keeps happening. No, no. Uh, this year, uh, talking about the great snipe, that was also uh, a very special situation because they, they do not like lacking on the snow. 
So it's normally the snow is normally gone when by the time they are lacking. Uh, so this year, uh, the only place where the snow was gone was in in, in the brooks and uh, and and the well, in the waterways basically. So they were got all gathered in this waterway. So I was shooting uh, lacking great snipes basically in the water, backlit fighting. It was just. <laughs> it was unreal and uh, just one of those experiences you really live for those rare opportunities are typically where your better images come from but like you said even you know with the when you were talking about the ermine they don't come around very often but when they do it's it's good to take full advantage after all these years of being in the field and it sounds like the same same for you and all of us is that it's always worth going because you never know. I mean, obviously there are many times that nothing happens, but like your ermine experience, if you hadn't gone out that day, wonderful things happen and, and those rare situations occur. And it's uh, the majority of trips, there's some treasure to be found, whether it's a day trip or, I mean, if we're not out there, we don't get them. And some days I'm like, oh, I only have a few hours. I'm not, I don't, shouldn't try, but then I go out and something magical happens. So it's just to inspire yeah. our listeners to make that effort and, and get out there whether you come away with amazing photographs like like Bernd uh, Ehrman or or just the visual experience, that's what we live for. And that's that, wildlife that's, photography. That's the unpredictability. Those rare shots, those wolverine encounters to spot them in Norway, in, in Alaska, it happens, but not if you're not there, right? So you can never never know for sure. So it's, in, it's inspirational to hear these stories and that your long-term commitment to being in the field when you can has resulted in these treasures image-wise and an and experience for you. Uh, what you say is absolutely true. Uh, you have to be out there and uh, if you know what to look for, uh, go to some kind of uh, hotspot or a place where things can happen. Uh, something happens most of the time. So, so go out there. I think that is the, the basic rule. It's great to come home with those fantastic images, but it's, it's, to me, it's equally important just to have been there and witness it and experience it. And a lot of the times the light doesn't cooperate and, and maybe the grouse or the ermine or, or whatever it might be may not step into a suitable lighting situation, but it was still wonderful to have that day's experience out there. And then once in a while, once in a blue moon, all those things line up. The light lines mm -hmm. up, the position of the animal, the behavior, and, and you develop an Instagram portfolio like Burnt's over over years of over adventure. how many years right many years <laughs> yes i have a question and we may or may not keep this on the podcast depending on how you oh. feel about it but looking at european photographers uh in some locations i'm not i'm not saying everywhere but it seems to be a little bit more accepted to and you touched on this earlier to bait animals and and baiting them into developed hides and that kind of thing is that just location based or is that is that just individual choice how does that work because i see especially like uh the wolf and bear i see images of them all the time but it's always in the same location mm -hmm. so it leads me to believe that they're probably baited to that location uh, I don't know that to be true. Uh, no, no, that that is. I'm sorry, uh, sorry, Mark. No, not at all. I, you you have far more insight on this. I just wanted to buffer it a, a little bit um, before you replied. In um, it seems to be a common and accepted practice in Finland. I met a fellow in Alberta in September who had done that as part of his photographic tour over there, and he. Um, elaborated a bit for me without Bernd having to, to say it himself, perhaps if he doesn't want to, but these permanent hides are there and it's common practice and it's, it's, and you actually sleep in them and there are bunks in them and, and it's just a matter of positioning and hoping the animals can buy. And it seems to be a, an accepted form of photo tourism there, which. No, no, it's, um, they started uh, doing that in Finland a couple of decades ago. And uh, it was Lasse Rautiainen who was the first uh, guy doing that. He was, a, he was and is a skilled nature photographer. Uh, and he started uh, baiting uh, for his own uh, purpose, um, the wolf and the moose. And the wolverine. Um, moose and, moose uh, as well. Yeah, I'm sorry, not the moose. Bear. But, but bear. the bear, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. 
um, uh, but it was uh, was feeding them moose um, um, road kills. Mm. Um, so so uh, he has developed that to uh, industry today uh, alongside a few other guys. Uh, and uh, so Finland, in Finland, that is an established and accepted practice. Um, I've been there twice myself. Uh, the 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 pro, and just to show that it is a, an accepted practice also in Norway. Uh, the prize for uh, winning the award Nature Photographer of the Year in Norway was actually a trip to Finland uh, for eight days to stay in these sites. So I've been there twice uh, doing that. A few years before, I was in Alaska. That was also a, a trip uh, that was uh, an award. But but anyway, um, from my, I, I have never I've been an open critic of of, of this, so I'm not uh, not concerned to be outspoken about it. I think it's great for people being able to experience wildlife like that, but it has also its its uh, ethical sides and. For, from my perspective, uh, creating a nature photography, uh, nature photography is a process that starts with from the beginning. If you come to some developed hide where someone has decided what angle you are to shoot from, uh, done all the groundwork, it's not your picture. Uh, so, so, so I'm not going to be a, a killjoy to everybody enjoying that experience because it's great experiences to be close to this, these wild animals. Uh, but in terms of the value of the f photo you get from those hides, I, 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 I don't care much for those pictures. But that is my personal view. In I, Norway, I agree 100%. Sorry. Uh, in, in Norway, you're not allowed to, to bait uh, the large predators. Uh, there are a couple of uh, places that has a permit to bait uh, eagles. Uh, and they have some world-class locations. Uh, just one uh, friend of mine, uh, Ole Martin Dahle, he has uh, maybe the most spectacular uh, white-tail eagle uh, location in Norway. And the way he baits uh, is uh, uh, per perfectly uh, natural. Uh, he goes out with his boat like the old fishermen did. Uh, the old fishermen, they... Uh, basically cleaned the fish out at sea and threw out the remains and the sea the, the, the sea eagles as we call them the white white tail eagles they always um, predated on on the, these fishing boats and he does the same thing and and he gets ex amazing results and ex amazing experiences from my perspective that is slightly different than baiting these uh, domesticating so to speak the these wild big predators Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I certainly didn't want to put a damper on our conversation, but I, I was curious about that because it seems to be a little bit different in in some places in Europe. But, you know, even in the U.S., there are places where you can go photograph not wild, not necessarily baited, but uh, trained animals, animals that are that are fully captive, they're trained. Some of these places take much better care of them than others. Um some people accept it, some people don't. It's just it's a matter of making sure that you identify that those animals are captive, but it is legal in the US. Yeah. So there are practices everywhere that we may feel one way or the other about. I, it was just something that I was curious about and I wanted to ask you while we had while we had you on, somebody that's very experienced in in different areas in Europe that might be able to answer that question for our for our listeners. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm not uh, uh, going actively to those places. Uh, so so uh, and that is not uh, um, moral and or eti ethical uh, judgment. Uh, it's basically that I don't like it, uh, and and I really like to create my images from scratch. And obviously, I, I can visit uh, a friend's hide, and um, my friends can visit my hides. And, and uh, join me on the lake and so on. So basically, as you talked about earlier, uh, networking and, and cooperating on certain uh, certain pictures uh, or certain situations or species, that is great. Uh, but um, the value of the experience, it's like going to the zoo. And, and I don't mm -hmm. fancy going to the zoo either. Yeah, the satisfaction that you get from an image that you created, that you worked for, certainly outweighs anything that might come quality wise from being able to get closer to an animal 
I I fully agree with that. And and those are the the memories that we have. You don't have a memory of, like you said, going to the zoo. You have the memory of getting out there and seeing those bears at 20 meters that were spooked off by whatever, Big possibly a, a male b- male grizzly. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've probably seen that after the cubs in Alaska where. I saw with cubs, similar situation, uh, two-year-old cubs wins a boar that might be half a mile away. It just rounded that mountainside and, and the scent picked up and they booked it to the hills. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable to watch how fast they vacated that area just because of his presence in autumn. But yeah, yeah I think in summary, we all strive to have the experience and the best images that resonate with us for years to come are those that we've discovered whether it's finding a new place and and figuring out in the wild how to work it or going on an adventure trip where we're canoeing for several days and something magical happens i mean those are the memories that wildlife photographers often hold on to most dearly so i mean that's that's my position as well. And those images, as, as, you, as you allude to, burn, I mean, there's a lot of similarity from what you see there as well because of the, the position, the angles and stuff. So it's, it's something that, yeah, it means far more to, to come across a, a wild experience in my, in my personal yeah. opinion. That's, that's what I prefer. And, and that's, what's, that's what the metal prints are for on the, on the studio walls are, are those ones. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, but but also uh, to me, uh, nature photography is sort of a solitary uh, thing, it's something you experience on your own or uh, with a good friend or colleague. Um, I enjoy very much working uh, with a good colleague, uh, but uh, three or four, then that's a crowd. Uh, so so waking up in a Finnish hide with. Um, 20 German t- tourists uh, sleeping next to you. That, that's uh, that's not nature uh, photography for me, to me. <laughs> you you need to come to Yellowstone or Grand Teton Park in the springtime, and there'd be three or four hundred. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I have I have been in Denali uh, National Park uh, during the rutting rutting season, and uh, I've been part of the crowd on the road there. So, so I have seen it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. You, it definitely doesn't feel like you want to feel. You know, like you talked about that solitary experience, or you and a you and a good friend out, just finding something to enjoy, and it's nice and quiet. It's it's yeah. more like photographing in the city. Yeah, and, and the term moose jam was something I, I, I learned in <laughs> the Denali National Park. <laughs> yes. And it only made sense after I saw it. The bus is lining up and <laughs> it was yes. crazy. Yeah. That's not a breakfast spread. <laughs> Don't put that on your toast. Right? A whole bunch of people just stopping for moose, as in, in most national parks for any yeah. wildlife that is visible. Yeah. Uh, for the gearheads in our audience, the tech side, what what cameras are you using these days? Are you have you switched to mirrorless? Is there a temptation there? Are you Canon? Are you Sony? Are you, what's the go to in Norway? <laughs> well, the, 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 what I say when people ask about gear, uh, I basically just say that I don't care so much about gear. Uh, I've been shooting with Canon equipment uh, for the last uh, ten years. Um, I, I'm uh, mainly using now uh, on, on the on the camera house. Uh, I have a, a one uh, one D Mark III, uh, and uh, I still have my five D Mark IV, uh, and I have a, a R5. Uh, so I have made the step into the uh, mirrorless world, and uh, I have to say that uh, it's almost cheating. Uh, it's uh, it's it's that good. So I'm 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 not paid by Canon or anybody else. But uh, but uh, that is just uh, I arranged as a trip this autumn just to just to visualize um, how good it is. Uh, I rented a small boat and uh, brought uh, some friends of mine of mine to to Spitsbergen. Oh, nice. um, and uh, and uh, I had just got my R5 in time, uh, and the other guys they were mainly there were one other Canon guy, and the rest of the guys were Olympus and uh, Nikon, and uh, the other guys after that trip they actually switched gears from Nikon and Olympus to Canon just to get that 
R5. The the uh, so I'm not going to. Uh, it's just crazy uh, the way uh, the the way it works. Well, what are two or three things that improved from the DSLR to the R5 mirrorless from your experience on that trip that changed? If it made it easier or whatever it might be to create the results that you're looking for, what were the advances that that you felt were no. most significant? No, I, I, the, the one the one thing that is a significant difference is the uh, focus, the the way the way it uh, is able to cling to the eye of any bird or animal throughout the uh, the frame uh, is just uh, something I've never experienced before. Uh, so, so, so that that, that is just uh, awesome. But also having a having eight thousand two hundred pixels uh, to to uh, to, to play with, uh, or eight point two million pixels uh, on one side is it's just uh, something. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, some something different. Uh, so I was shooting a polar bear uh, with uh, a 70 millimeter and got some. I could uh, cut into that and crop it down to 3,000 uh, pixels on the, on the long side and still have a, uh, an amazing result. Uh, you could make a two meter copy on the wall, and and it's it's just a different world. So so I I never th thought uh, that I would. Uh, like that equipment much because it's plastic. It um, doesn't look good. It it's, uh, feels bad. Everything looks bad. But when you the technology inside is just amazing. So uh, I'm probably going to get one more house and and get rid of my uh, of my uh, uh, 5D. Uh, I'm going to keep the keep the one the X Mark III um, because it's so stable and uh, reliable. Uh, yeah. It's bad news for 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 the other camera brands. I'm afraid. It's you know, something that went a few years ago when the Nikon D850 came out, and I picked up that camera to have the 46 megapixel sensor and have that crop ability from a horizontal to vertical. It was a game changer in post for me in production and just versatility of composition. And I mean, that's one of the things the R5, as you alluded to, offers. But the autofocus. So the polar bear having a darker eye, and the polar bear being white. It's it's stuck with that quite well. The autofocus tracked well with those animals on that trip for you for the R5. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think so. Uh, the but I would highlight one other dif uh, difference as uh, as well. Uh, that is which is very important to me uh, shooting mostly wildlife, and that is the sound. Uh, it's it's no sound. Uh, while if you have a shot with a one the X Mark III, it sounds like. Uh, uh, some drummer uh, sitting <laughs> just behind you, and 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 uh, I've done all kind of tricks throughout the years to try to reduce that noise, putting a lot of cloth uh, around my camera and stuff like that. Uh, but that also opens a new world shooting wildlife uh, up close um, with that equipment. That was the biggest biggest game changer for me. And I shot the Nikon D850. Well, I still have it right now that sounds past tense to me okay. <laughs> i still have it but um picking up that r5 i mean it is dead silent i'm scared to put it on the silent mode because i've heard horror stories of people that uh you know when you put it on the silent mode you're 22 frames per second and i'm afraid of what i would come home to when i when i go to edit those images how many would be there that, that's true. Uh, the first night I used this equipment, uh, I was uh, at the red-throated loon uh, pond, uh, an amazing place, by the way, uh, just an amazing place. Uh, and uh, I had this uh, exact weather I was looking for, uh, no wind, uh, you get the moist coming up uh, when the sun sets. You have this amazing color through night, I was shooting through the night. And then you have this amazing um, sunrise. And um, I got home with 12,000 images, and it's just crazy. It, it drives you crazy to just go through them. And <laughs> and and 8,000 of them are usable. So 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 it's uh, <laughs> you have to kill your darlings when you go through. Uh, uh, but, but again, it's dangerous. You have to be uh, <laughs> focused. <laughs> Yeah, that, that takes up a lot of space with those larger files. You you might need a new computer 
definitely a yeah. new uh, new drive. I put in an order. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just saw on YouTube that there's some new chip coming out that's allowing the new MacBooks to edit 8K. Yeah, the oh. M- M1 chip. Yeah. I M1 believe, chip. Yeah. I, yeah, I watched part of it last night. It got a little late for me, so I didn't finish it, but it's it's queued up to watch more. That sounds that sounds exciting. At least that we can manage this video, perhaps, right? They've and not that you it could do the it could do the 4K as well then, which is the target. Yeah, so. they've got to keep up with technology, I guess, with Mhm. Well, it sounds like the the way that they're doing it on the chip is allowing it to be accessed differently. So it I think it is going to be a game changer because right now you your workflow just gets bogged down and it's very hard to do but and we're just talking first generation you wait till they come out with the real pro models it should be pretty awesome so Bernd, uh a quick question too did you happen to try the new one to 500 millimeter lens if you did just question on feedback or whether you were using a lens that you already had on the r5 no no i haven't used i haven't uh, uh, bought any of the new lenses i um, used my old gear and um, uh, 600 millimeter, uh, and um, my, uh, basically, basically three lenses I use. It's the 70 to 200, uh, to 8, and the 200 to 400 with the inbuilt uh, converter, one four converter. That's an amazing uh, piece of equipment. It's heavy. You have to bring a tractor to bring it along, but still, it's amazing. <laughs> It's the the flexibility, uh, and then the 600 millimeter, often with a 1.4 converter. Very now, good. what version of the 600 are you shooting with? Um, it's a 604 uh, Mark III. The the light one. Yes, it's so light. It, it feels it's like fantastic. they filled that with helium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's uh, that made a difference. And if you put uh, one of the mirrorless cameras behind, it doesn't weigh anything. So I, handheld all the time for that, or for uh, still photography, or how do you work it? I have used the tripod to a minimal degree, even on the nighttime photography. I, I use uh, bags of uh, peas or, or bags of uh, rice uh, as stabilization because I normally shoot from the ground uh, when I'm doing uh, these backlit uh, scenes. And and uh, so and now uh, you, when you when you have the stabilizer on the R5, it's even. It's even uh, less use of a, a tripod. Uh, the scene up in uh, with, with the bears I mentioned earlier, that was, luckily, my camera was on the tripod so I could shoot. Uh, if not, I would need both hands. And <laughs> one hand yeah. was on the bear spray. <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the grizzly bears you're talking about. Yeah. Back yeah. with that one, yes. But on a boat, like your trip to Spitsbergen, and you would, because of the moving boat, it would be handheld versus a tripod. Uh, yes, it's all, yeah. all handheld. Right. So what's what's next? What's the one thing that you have not been able to capture that you that you are longing to? Ah, that's a good question. Um, it, it's it, That is a lot, actually. I have several <laughs> uh, unfulfilled dreams. So, so, but what I'm planning, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this winter I'm going to do some work on the muskox. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is a species I haven't worked with in the past. Um, so uh, extreme weather conditions and hopefully with some light uh, mixed into it. Um, then uh, I have, uh, I'm dreaming of a winter trip to uh, to Spitsbergen, um, uh, doing polar polar bears and and uh, Arctic foxes uh, up there uh, with. Uh, 10 minus 20 centigrades, uh, the blue, um, pinkish colors. Um, mm-hmm. Again, the breath, uh, backlit, all, all that stuff. Uh, that is something I'm hopefully able to do soon, but I'm probably not having time for that this winter. Now, at, at your latitude, when you go in the winter time, how much light do you actually have? How many hours per day can you actually shoot? No, it uh, on my latitude it's uh, uh, 66 degrees north, uh, and uh, so so in the middle of the winter uh, the sun barely gets across uh, the horizon, uh, so it's a couple of hours of uh, daylight. But again, uh, the the light uh, the hour before and the hour after is just uh, spectacular. So mm-hmm. we still have a few hours to shoot. So you'd be shooting around four hours per day, and then you can 
probably play with Aurora, things like that at night? Uh, of course. Uh, but again, Aurora is also something I haven't done really. I'm, um, if it's not an animal in the or a bird in the frame, uh, I don't bother shoot shooting. Does Spitsbergen have the uh, reindeer, like Svalbard? Yes, they they do. It's, uh, it's a subspecies of the reindeer we have in Norway. Uh, mm -hmm. It's short, stubby feet, uh, very much accommodated to to the cold temperatures. So that would be my spirit animal because I've got short, stubby legs also. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that's how we figure that out. <laughs> Be standing in front of the mirror tonight. I'm not sure if it well, is either, but trying to figure this out. Yeah, they, <laughs> they kind of resemble my build. <laughs> the the wintertime photography, but do you have any desire to travel anywhere else, or is there just too much to do around home, within no. a ten minute radius? No, no, I have no plans to travel with the exception of the Spitsbergen or Svalbard uh, trip. Uh, so um, it's so much undone, uh, just close to my home. Uh, so uh, that will uh, occupy me f as long as I uh, am able to shoot, so to speak. Yes. There's a lot. There's not, I have no. Um, I am uh, planning to go back to Alaska because, again, it's like no Norway on steroids. Uh, it's just uh, fantastic up there. So uh, I'm planning uh, one trip there uh, sometime, not the next couple of years, but who knows? Well, let us know. <laughs> Michael's typically up there, you know, part of every year, and then we all three spend time up there, so it would be fun to shoot with you in the field. Yeah, the same. Uh, I will definitely do so. Four would be a crowd. Or five if Jason's there also. <laughs> we can split up, divide and conquer. What would you, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out? I mean, you started as a young person, obviously. But for those people, you know, these college graduates, there's hundreds of young photographers, thousands of young photographers that are just kind of getting started. Or people like yourself who are professional and just need that quiet escape, but they're brand new to wildlife photography. What kind of advice would you give that person? I have uh, given this same advice for many years, and I, I still believe it's as true at, as it was uh, when I started giving this advice. Um, one, uh, focus on what is close in your vicinity, in your neighborhood. Try to, if it's in your local park, if, if it's in your garden, there is wildlife there. Uh, you just have to be patient, learn about it, find out what they are, uh, are about to do. And, and you can shoot amazing stuff. And which brings me to the next portion of, next part of that advice. Uh, focus on one species or a few species to, if you want to really get spectacular results. Uh, the more you repeat and do the same thing, the more you learn and the better the results are. That is my very simple advice. Stay close uh, to your home or your cabin or wherever you are and uh, find people can travel, but, uh, but you rarely get the amazing shots on an occasional trip. Uh, you get the fantastic sh shots when you work hard with your selected topic for months on end. I think that's sound advice for 2020, especially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many of us don't have any choice but to stay close uh, to home in 2020. I know that advice, oh, that uh, tip is very boring, uh, but I, I believe it's true. Oh, it's not oh, boring sorry. at all. It's, it's very sound. And, I, you know, it's something that we've, we've all talked about to a degree at one point or another, but it's, it's probably the best advice that I think any of us could give. It's a great way to learn light and to learn the species and to improve the portfolio and, and skill set of any photographer is that repetition. So I don't think it's boring at all. I think it, that's a, a great way for people to establish their portfolio. And then when they go on those highlight trips, when time and, and funds permit, you know, they'll be that much more prepared to collect something magical when it happens. Because mm. it can be awfully exciting when you've traveled somewhere and everything's happening in front and that camera gear has got to stay 
working, focused, keeping the energy down, the adrenaline, you know, the more experience you have with your camera gear, it's an extension of yourself or becomes that. So practicing more around home makes it better all around. I think it's a great pro tip. Michael, do you have anything else for Brent? I don't. I want to make sure we throw out the uh, Instagram feed one more time. And then I, I saw on your feed that you have your website linked in there so people can get to your website. But I'll also put put it in the show notes. So uh, the uh, uh, com site, I have a few images lay, laying out there, but uh, it's it's not very good at keeping it updated, I'm afraid. Well, you do your Instagram. Yes, of course, uh, yes, I do yes. that. And I did see on your website that you sell prints, so I'm assuming that anything that somebody would see on your Instagram feed, you would sell based off of those prices that appear on your website, right? Yeah, that's true. And, uh, and actually, that's uh, especially before Christmas now, a lot of people are just sending me. Uh, so I, I have engaged my son to to follow up on that, to, to do all the practicalities, uh, to get the prints and send them out and so on. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for uh, giving us your, your evening, our morning, uh, but giving us your, your evening and sharing with our audience, you know, the work that you've done fantastic uh, portfolio that you've got obviously as you know what i couldn't even count them four or five time winner of the norwegian Four. wildlife photographer of the year but that's yeah that's for all of norway and truthfully norway's a spectacular magical landscape i mean I'm and a always... lot of talented photographers there mm -hmm. just drawn yeah. to the north and and it, an amazing part of the world to play with light in imagery it's always fun to see what talented norwegian photographers collect and i i'm always i'm drawn to norway hope to get there someday so it's you know a pleasure to to hear your insight and your experiences and your stories from your home country yeah uh, thank you very much for having me uh, and also should you visit norway don't hesitate to contact me i'll show you some really nice spots I, 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 if I, I had will. a Star Trek transporter, I would be activating it right now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nice to know that if we did visit and, and got ourselves in a bind, that we would have legal representation also. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> I have to tell you one one uh, one uh, small story about that. Uh, last time I was in Alaska, uh, Dag Retterang, a very, very talented Norwegian photographer, joined me. He's mostly into landscapes and uh, details, a very creative uh, photographer. Uh, but he enjoyed uh, shooting wildlife with me in Denali. When going back, um, uh, he had somehow forgotten his bear spray in his backpack, trying to oh. get it through security. And uh, so, so he, he needed some help in uh, explaining himself out of that situation. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you, Bent. And uh, I, I do look forward to, as Mark said, the opportunity to come over to Norway and to see that beautiful country. Oh, thank you, Bernd. It's been a pleasure to meet you and to hear your stories. And for all of you listeners out there, make sure you check us out at wildandexposed.com. You'll find today's show notes and links there as well. Check out our YouTube channel. This podcast will be on YouTube. You can watch it and enjoy it at your leisure. Take the time, please, to subscribe. Give us a thumbs up, that five-star rating, as that allows us to do what we love to do and to bring you this content on a weekly basis. Until next time. For my esteemed contributors and myself, thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. And make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna make it someday. Nothing's gonna get in our way. We will be the biggest band in town. Round and round the world we'll go